How do rich people react to the ministry of Jesus? That's what we're going to find out today in Luke 19. We have talked a little bit about rich people and different reactions we have. We've known some of them, the rich ruler who turned away because he didn't want to give up all that he had. We also know of other rich people, too, like Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, who used their wealth for the ministry of God. We're going to meet a new one today, and he is Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus lived in Jericho. Because it says he entered Jericho, we believe that this is the new city of Jericho, the fancy one that Herod the Great built. And like I said, I've been there before. Beautiful. Jericho is a beautiful town. And it's not too terribly far away from Jerusalem. There is a hike that you can walk back and forth from Jericho to Jerusalem. So Zacchaeus sees the crowd and he's a rich tax collector. How did he get rich? Not well. I don't think the Romans paid that well. Usually what they did is they wrote up a tax bill that was higher than what people owed and then took the rest. Oh, it looks here like you owe a hundred denarii for your taxes. He'd take half of it. But he ran ahead. He wanted desperately to see Jesus. He climbs up on a tree and Jesus sees him and says, come down from the tree. I'm going to stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus came down. I'm glad short people are recognized in the Bible. I am short. And so we appreciate it. But when they saw it, they all got mad because this man's a sinner. He's a tax collector, right? So the Pharisees, the establishment in the temple are all going to be mad about this. And Zacchaeus came right away and confessed to Jesus, stood before it said the Lord, behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I defrauded anyone, I will restore it fourfold. I'm going to multiply it times four. Jesus says in ESV, today salvation came to this house since he is a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. It's not just the Gentiles who are lost. The book is written primarily for the Gentiles, but it's also people who are the sons of Abraham. They are lost as well. I think that's the thing that the Pharisees couldn't get through their heads. We have this right. We're doing the right thing. He's going out there and saving all these Gentiles, not recognizing they needed saving too. So he's not quite on his way to Jerusalem yet, but he's getting there and he's on his path. It's also interesting to note that Jesus knew his name before he introduced himself. And you compare this then to the rich ruler, the rich ruler who wouldn't give up what he had, but Zacchaeus who understood not only the role of money, that he should be using it for kingdom things, but that he has ripped people off and he's going to make amends for that. Someone said, quote, rich people have not fared well in Luke's gospel so far. But here we have a man who has wealth, bearing very well. The name Zacchaeus, we're told, means clean or innocent. So even though he wasn't innocent, he is made innocent by his confession. It's also a callback to the lost people that we saw a couple of chapters ago in Luke 15. Jesus sees that this is a lost person being reclaimed, being found. The Pharisees, they just look at the lost or the people they regard as lost because they're prideful, as just lost. There's no hope for him. He's a sinner. They never saw the ability to be redeemed. But yet, redemption comes to everybody. Now we have the parables of the ten minas. And it says, because they were near Jerusalem, they were thinking that the, you know, this is coming to a head, that the kingdom of God is going to appear right now. So Jesus tells this parable about how there was a nobleman went off into a, a far country to get himself a kingdom and called 10 servants and gave them 10 minas, which is a coin, and said to them, engage in business, do things with the money. But the citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him. We don't want this man here. We don't want a kingdom here. Don't build your kingdom here. And so then eventually the man came back and he ordered his servants who he'd given money to so that he could start gaining this business. And they came to him and said, Lord, your mina, your one coin, has made 10 mina more. Good. You did great. And because you were faithful and very little, 
I am going to give you authority over 10 cities. Then the second one came and said, have taken the mina and made five minas. This, again, the similar to the story, the parable of the talents where a man was given one, five, and 10 talents, and then they returned it into more money. So you can see that each of them are coming in and saying, hey, I did it. And then the one guy said, hey, I have your mina. I kept it hidden away in his handkerchief because it says you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit. You reaped what you did not sow. And the man says, I condemn you with my own words, you wicked servant. You knew I'm harsh. I'm a mean dude. But by taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow, so I, I didn't even earn this money, but I had it anyway, and you didn't do anything with it. And at my coming, I collected it, and you, all the other ones brought me additional money and said, you know what, you take that coin and give it to one of them that made more with it. And they're like, well, why are you giving it to the guy who already has 10? He's richer than anybody. And this is where Jesus comes in. For everyone who has will be given more. But those who didn't do anything with what they've been given, it's going to be taken away. They're the enemies of mine. They didn't even want me to be the leader over them. Bring them here and then slaughter them before me. Woo so this is even a little bit stronger than the 10 talents uh, parable that we heard before. So people feel that this story is based on Archelaus, who is the son of Herod. Again, this is a man who didn't earn his money, but his father earned all that money and gave it to his sons. And so he went out to gain sovereignty over part of his father's kingdom. Then he went out and tried to claim kingdom of his own. But it said that a group of Jewish scholars, Jewish people went out and also went to Rome to say, don't give it to him. He hasn't earned it. He hasn't done anything with it. But the emperor of Rome gave it to him anyway, appointed him a ruler over half of his father's kingdom and wouldn't let him call himself king, but did give him land over it. So part of this nobleman going out and trying to seek his own kingdom is probably Archelaus. And Bob Guzak, who I was watching videos of on YouTube a few weeks ago talking about the various parables, talked about how Jesus brings up examples like the dishonest servant like the judge who didn't care about God. And now he's bringing up this example of Archelaus trying to gain a kingdom of himself. It's not like this is a true story because we have the servants who were given money, but it's based on that. And he said that these parables that use dishonest people, sinful people, are there because we recognize it. It's a parable we understand. You know, just like when we learned fables when we were kids, we understood the grasshopper who was lazy and didn't gather for himself while the ant was collecting for winter. Examples using bad people are knowledgeable to us. And people would have known the story of Archelaus at that time, known about people who sought kingdoms for themselves. So in this case, he's using a bad man, just like the bad servant, as an example, because it's a story we would understand and we would get. But Again, the servants, some of them invested the resources and grew the business, grew opportunities in that new place. But that last man was unproductive. He hid the money away. He was scared because the mas it says the master was a hard man and it just didn't do anything. And the king is mad because you were given something and you did nothing with it. The parable is, again, going back to the fact that we are accountable to God, that we are to take the gifts, the money, but our talents too, our abilities, any gift we have from God, and we are meant to use them in the service of God. We are meant to grow what we have. And if you grow what you have, then more will be given to you because you have used your skills and talents. And we've seen that. We've seen people who have amazing abilities, and as they use their skills and talents, get more abilities. We have seen people get more from what they were given. It comes a little bit in the way of why I wanted to do this podcast, because when I was reading the Bible and I was thinking about, what am I good at? What talents has God given me? I feel God has made me a talker. I'm good at talking with people. I'm a software trainer. I relate to people who are trying to use software and trying to solve some of their problems why I got started in podcasting. 
but what am I doing to serve God with his gifts and talents? And that's when Small Steps with God was born because I thought that would be a way I could give back by doing podcasts about Christian living and how we can do better. But then I thought about this, that I could do from a lay person's point of view, can we get through the Bible? This is me trying to use my talents, hopefully, <laughs> to serve God because I was confronted by these passages. What am I doing? I'm not doing anything. Are you sure you can give money? And sure, you can give some of your resources. You can also use your house. Again, when Jesus saw that Peter had a boat, he used Peter's boat. God will use everything that we're given in his service. But this podcast was my attempt to try to use the talents and make more from those talents. That's, I mean, in the end, these parables are what convicted me to do this. But the question is, is when you've been given so much by God, what are you doing? in order to give back, in order to collect more people. That's what's really the essence of what we're talking about here. But in the end, the one servant who did nothing with the money, kept it in a handkerchief, disobeyed what order he was given. We're told to take what we have, take our gifts, take our talents, take our money, take everything we have, take our boat, and give it in the use of the Lord. He didn't want to do that. He's saying. Because you are so powerful, because you're a hard man, you didn't even have to do anything to get this money. I'm not doing what you said. Outright disobedience. Now Jesus begins his part where he's going to enter Jerusalem. It says triumphal. But this is again going to be the Mount of Olives, where he's going to come down the Kidron Valley and come up into Jerusalem. They got near to Bethphage. Bethany means house of unripened figs or early figs. And Bethany is in near the Mount of Olives. He sent the disciples to go get the donkeys, the colts that were tied. And if anyone asks you, tell them the Lord needs it. So they did that. It's exactly what they did. And when Jesus started coming into the city, lowly donkey, not a war horse of a king, even though he is the king, People started throwing his cloaks. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisees were like, hey, tell your people to shut up. (laughs) I guess or something like that. Jesus says, quote in ESV, I tell you, if these were silent, these people, the very stones would cry out. This is something that's so remarkable that even the earth itself is going to cry out if this happens. You can't tell people to shut up. Keep in mind that a donkey is going to be what a man, a lowly man, is going to ride into the city with, or maybe a priest, but not a king, not a rich man. Pilate probably comes into Jerusalem on his horse. Zechariah prophesies as a man of peace coming into the city of Jerusalem. The idea, too, of saying these stones are going to cry out it was something that we've seen a few times where Jesus personifies places, mountains throwing themselves in or trees uprooting themselves and throwing them in. Now the stones themselves are going to call out. It's just something we've seen Jesus say before, but I think it means the very nature of this world would cry out because Jesus is entering Jerusalem. That's how important this is. One of the commentaries said that we don't know which path Jesus took coming down off the Mount of Olives into the old city of Jerusalem. My friends and I were up on the Mount of Olives. There's a church there called the Church of All Nations. And then there's the Olive Grove that was probably there at the time of Jesus. It was probably where he went and prayed. We wanted to walk down, walk in that valley. I was not a Christian. I didn't get it. I didn't know why we were walking down there. There's an ancient cemetery across the way. So we did it. We walked through this valley and walk down to the old city. The gate is closed because, again, the Ottoman Empire closed the gate to prevent the Messiah from entering in triumphantly into Jerusalem again. See, well, we're going to stop him. But it's an incredible walk to do this. And you see incredible things of these tombstones. You can see the tombstone of Zechariah, Absalom, the son of David, tomb of Pharaoh's daughter, Annas, the high priest, tomb of Caiaphas, and the family tomb of Herod. Wow. My friends on the dig were touched by this entire walk, and I thought it was cool. But now I see 
how cool it is. And so when they say they don't know his path, I don't think there's many paths there. I mean, of course, you could probably walk down anywhere. So they're saying you don't know the exact route. You would see people coming down the hill from the Mount of Olives and then coming up into Jerusalem. It would have been a sight for sure. As he's getting closer to the city, it says Jesus wept for the city. You know, you're going to see when your enemies come, they're going to set up barricades. They're going to surround the city on every side and they're going to tear it down to the ground. You, your children, everything inside of it, not one stone will be left upon another. And this is predicting that in 70 AD, Romans are going to surround the city. There was a rebellion that was going on and they did exactly that. They tore the city down to the ground. Anyone in the city was slaughtered. I understand that some were sent away for slavery, but this was a massacre. And Jesus weeps for the city because he knows what's going to happen with it, that this is going to be shortly, within 40 years, the end of this city. In the earlier church, they removed the passages about Jesus weeping over the city because would a perfect Lord weep? And I think a perfect Lord would weep. You know, we get this image, I think, in every generation of what Jesus is like. Oh, he's perfect. He's the Lord. He's not going to weep. But we see so many places where Jesus has joy. He weeps. He even jokes a little bit. I don't think the people in the early church or the Middle Ages got the pure humanity of Jesus. He then goes on to cleanse the temple. Again, this turned into a den of robbers. It has turned it into this place where these vendors were ripping people off for exchanging money for selling animals to be sacrificed at the temple. This had turned into a giant tourist trap. All these people are going to come into Jerusalem to worship God, and they are getting ripped off by all these people. And you know what? The temple structure, the people of the temple, were getting a cut of it, most likely. So he cleans it out. This city is meant to be for the city of God. This is supposed to be a place of worship, and look what you've become. And it says that at that point, the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people, so leaders, now are going to destroy him. They knew that there's nothing that they can do because everyone was listening to it. So they couldn't do it then, but they're starting their plot against him. And that ends chapter 19. What I'm going to meditate on is that picture of Jesus coming down off of the Mount of Olives on a donkey with people throwing their cloaks putting palm branches on the ground and praising God. They knew for a moment who this was and that this was the teacher coming in to Jerusalem. Some of them thought he was coming in not to bring the kingdom of God, but to bring back the redemption of Jerusalem as a city against the Romans. Some people were going to be the very people probably who were yelling crucify him in a few days. For that moment, seeing that glory of Jesus coming down into this valley and then coming up the other side into Jerusalem. I'm going to meditate on that. And make sure you take a look at some pictures of this Kindrone Valley and it's just to see what it looks like. It's really pretty incredible. What I'm going to pray about is that I'm doing enough to take my talents, that I'm using what I have in the glory of God and his kingdom and the things that are eternal, not the things that are material. And what I'm going to share with other people is the fact that God does not want us to care about what's in our house, what's in Sodom and Gomorrah, what we have, what these coins that we have are, but instead wants us to use them to invest in other people. Take everything that we have to make friends of other people, to bring them to the Lord, to give opportunities to talk about the Lord. What are we doing with what we have? Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, subscribe to the podcast. Tell some friends about it. If you know some people you think might enjoy it, they can catch up by going to the website. All the podcasts are there. They're organized by books, so you can listen to them anytime you wish, or the podcasts are always there too. They can also, if they want, start up in John. It's never too late to start going through the Bible slowly. And with the idea we're going to try to get a good understanding of what's going on from a layman's point of view. Thank you so much.